Hi guys, Dane here, and we have finally made it. Today I'm going to be reviewing The Last Battle by C.S. Lewis, which is book number seven in the Chronicles of Narnia series. As usual, I should begin with a blurb. The Last Battle is the greatest of all battles. During the last days of Narnia, the land faces its fiercest challenge. Not an invader from without, but an enemy from within. Lies and treachery have taken root, and only the king and a small band of loyal followers can prevent the destruction of all they hold dear in this, the magnificent ending to the Chronicles of Narnia. Unfortunately, I didn't think this was magnificent. Uh, this is probably my second least favourite book of the series, Behind the Horse and His Boy. I mean, the storyline is kind of get of all the battles and stuff is kind of getting a bit wearying by now. And to be fair, the way they got to this battle was different. We sort of start here with like an invader to the throne, uh, a, a, an, an ape and an, a donkey uh, find like a, a lion's pelt and then the donkey puts the pelt on and then the ape convinces everyone that it's Aslan and that he's Aslan's spokesperson and then yeah basically this fake Aslan sells everyone into slavery and then there is a fight for uh, Narnia's survival and then I got really confused by what happened at the end because I think in the way I read it anyway everybody died and then like they were reborn into a new peaceful Narnia but it was like a heaven metaphor. So the problem with this was that I got, because I got bored with it, by the end of it I was kind of skim reading, so I don't think I took everything in. So the first flag that I've put in here is for a place called Caldron Pool, and it says here, the waterfall keeps the pool always dancing and bubbling and churning round and round as if it were on the boil. And that of course is how it got its name of Caldron Paul. Pool. I mean, shouldn't it be Cauldron Pool? Uh, here we get another example of how C.S. Lewis justifies killing animals I guess like he's pro hunting because animals can't talk basically so this character here says uh, it ought to be buried we must have a funeral oh it wasn't a talking line you needn't bother about that so fuck it then because it couldn't talk like I was thinking about doing a video on this of like the weird philosophies of CS Lewis because by that logic fine to eat babies because they can't talk so it's fine we can hunt babies if we want I mean they probably won't put up much of a fight but then Tyrion, not like Game of Thrones Tyrion, he gets a bit angry, so um, when Tyrion knew that the horse was one of his own Narnians, there came over him and over Jules such a rage that they did not know what they were doing. The king's sword went up, the unicorn's horn went down, they rushed forward together. Next moment both the Calamens lay dead, the one beheaded by Tyrion's sword and the other gored through the heart by Jules' horn. So basically these guys had got some of the talking horses of Narnia and were like putting them to work. So they just killed them. They didn't, like, ask them, like, what are you doing? They didn't try and solve the problem with words. They just killed them. And then, the next page that is talked about. Jewel, said the king, we have done a terrible deed. We were sorely provoked, said Jewel. But to leap on them unawares, without defying them, while they were unarmed. Foe, we are two murderers, Jewel. I am dishonoured forever. And, I, and it is like, yeah, you did murder those two people. So we have this quote from the ape once he's bossing people about. Now don't you stop... Now don't you start arguing, said the ape, for it's a thing I won't stand. I'm a man, you're only a fat, stupid old bear. What do you know about freedom? You think freedom means doing what you like. Well, you're wrong. That isn't true freedom. True freedom means doing what I tell you. It's kind of a bit like the attitude that the press has, isn't it? And he does this thing which always annoys me where he directly addresses the reader. He says, you know how sad your own dog's face can look sometimes? And it's like, I don't have a dog. Drags me out of the story. Uh, so we also get this bit, which was quite a nice, quite a nice little callback, I guess. So, ha, cried Tyrion. Are you then that Eustace and that Jill who rescued King Rillian from his long enchantment? Yes, that's us, said Jill. So he's King Rillian now, is he? Oh, of course he would be, I forgot. Nay, said Tyrion. I am the seventh in descent from him. He has been dead over 200 years. Jill made a face. Ugh, she said. That's the horrid part about coming back to Narnia. So we get that, that's a nice little reference there to the sort of time dilation effect that doesn't make any sense and isn't consistent. And then there's some talk about the magic rings that were mentioned in uh, The Magician's Nephew. So again, that was a nice little reference back as well. They were, they'd actually been buried somewhere in London and Peter from The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, he'd had to like sneak into this back garden in the dead of night with a shovel to try and dig it up. Here we get this fairly troubling part where uh, Tyrion is trying to get them to dress up as Calumet and he says, and look on this stone bottle. In there is this juice which, when we have rubbed it on our hands and faces, will make us brown as Calumet. 
Oh hurrah, said Jill. Disguises, I love disguises. Yeah, I love blacking up, me. Again, we get this other thing referenced back to C.S. Lewis's weird approach to when it's fine to kill animals. Indeed, she had succeeded in shooting a rabbit. Not a talking rabbit, of course. There were lots of the ordinary kind about in Western Narnia. And he was already skinned, cleaned and hanging up. Mate, I think even though it can't talk, if it could talk, it would be saying, please don't skin me, clean me and hang me up. I do like this uh, little exchange here, which kind of highlights gender differences, I guess. But if she was a boy, she'd have to be knighted, wouldn't she, sire? If she was a boy, said Tyrion, she'd be whipped for disobeying orders. Why not both? Okay, and then it's revealed that the fake Aslan was a fake, and um, uh, what's his name? Uh, the king, he comes across a bunch of dwarves uh, that are being like led by Calamon's soldiers. So this happens. Give the password, said the chief soldier. This is my password, said the king as he drew his sword. The light is dawning, the lie broken. Now guard thee, miscreant, for I am Tyrion of Narnia. He flew upon the chief soldier like lightning. Eustace, who had drawn his sword when he saw the king draw his, rushed at the other one. His face was deadly pale, but I wouldn't blame him for that. And he had the look that beginners sometimes do have. He forgot all that Tyrion had tried to teach him that afternoon, slashed wildly, indeed I'm not sure his eyes weren't shut, and suddenly found, to his own surprise, that the Calamen lay dead at his feet. And though that was a great relief, it was at the moment rather frightening. The king's fight lasted a second or two longer. Then he too had killed his man and shouted to Eustace, Where are the other two? But the dwarves had settled the two remaining Calamen. There was no enemy left. Again, you just killed those people without trying to negotiate. <laughs> You've learned nothing. And you got a teenage boy to murder him as well. And then the king inspects Eustace's sword and found that Eustace had put it back in the sheath all messy from killing the Calamen. He was scolded for that and made to clean and polish it. He shouldn't have been killing Calamen at all. We have this line that really bothered me. Um, they're talking about Jill and, and she's got a unicorn friend. She thought, and she wasn't far wrong, that he was the shiningest, delicatest, most graceful animal she had ever met. And he was so gentle and soft of speech that if you hadn't known, you would hardly have believed how fierce and terrible he could be in battle. Shiningest and delicatest are not words. Most shiny, most delicate, I believe. I know it's probably done because it's a children's book, so it's supposed to entertain, but as an adult, it just irritated. Sorry. <laughs> okay, this is a long old excerpt here, but I do want to read this because this is an interesting insight into like the history of Narnia, I suppose. But the unicorn explained to her that she was quite mistaken. He said that the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve were brought out of their own strange world into Narnia only at times when Narnia was stirred and upset. But she mustn't think it was always like that. In between their visits, there were hundreds and thousands of years when peaceful king followed peaceful king till you could hardly remember their names or count their numbers. And there was really hardly anything to put into the history books. And he went on to talk of old queens and heroes whom she had never heard of. He spoke of Swan White, the queen who had lived before the days of the White Witch and the Great Winter, who was so beautiful that when she looked into any forest pool, the reflection of her face shone out of the water like a star by night for a year and a day afterwards. He spoke of Moonwood, the hare, who had such ears that he could sit by Cauldron Pool under the thunder of the great waterfall and hear what men spoke in whispers at Care Paravel. He told how King Gael, who was ninth in descent from Frank the First of all kings, had sailed far away into the eastern seas and delivered the Lone Islanders from a dragon and how, in return, they had given him the Lone Islands to be part of the royal lands of Narnia forever. He talked of whole centuries in which all Narnia was so happy that notable dances and feasts, or at most tournaments, were the only things that could be remembered, and every day and week had been better than the last. And as he went on, the picture of all those happy years, all the thousands of them, piled up in Jill's mind till it was rather like looking down from a high hill onto a rich, lovely plain full of woods and waters and cornfields, which spread away and away till it got thin and misty from distance. Man, that made my voice hurt from doing that. And then this big battle's coming up and the king tries to send the kids home because he's like, it's too dangerous. And uh, Eustace is like, nah, we can't go home. And he's like, oh, I, I like your loyalty. And he's like, no, it's not that. We literally, we can't go home. We have no way of getting home. Yeah, so when the kids sort of travel to Narnia in this book, it's kind of unclear what happened because they were on a train and then there was potentially a train crash. And so they have this little conversation. But I mean, what will happen in our own world? Shall we wake up and find ourselves back in that train? Or should we just vanish and never be heard of anymore? Or shall we be dead in England? So this is what would happen if they die in Narnia. Gosh, I never thought of that. It'll be rum for Peter and the others if they saw me waving out of the window and then when the train comes in, we're nowhere to be found. 
Or if they found two, I mean, if we're dead over there in England. Ugh, said Jill. What a horrid idea. It wouldn't be horrid for us, said Eustace. We shouldn't be there. And so again, I think this like lends credence to the idea that they all died. <laughs> oh yeah, then we get the word darky is used a couple of times, which again, not so good. Then Jill starts crying, but she remembers to take her face away from her bow. She says, even if I can't stop blubbing, I won't get my string wet. Well, surely the odd tear or two isn't going to make a huge amount of difference. Here we have quite a troubling little line from the dwarves, but it also does sound oddly like nationalist groups in today's world. Keep it up, boys, said Griffel's voice. All together, carefully. We don't want darkies any more than we want monkeys or lions or kings. The dwarfs are for the dwarfs. And then we have a reunion where like all of the characters that have gone to Narnia before all go there. Except for, uh, except for Queen Susan. My sister Susan, answered Peter shortly and gravely, is no longer a friend of Narnia. Oh, Susan, said Jill. She's interested in nothing nowadays except nylons and lipstick and invitations. She always was a jolly sight too keen on being grown up. Because Eustace explains that uh, whenever you've tried to get her to come and talk about Narnia or do anything about Narnia, she says, what wonderful memories you have. Fancy you're still thinking about all those funny games we used to play when we were children. Which kind of implies that Susan is the only one that actually grew up out of the lot. Then towards the end, uh, Aslan calls all of the stars home. It says here, it, this is a reference to one of the previous books as well. The last few seconds before the reign of stars had quite ended were very exciting. Stars began falling all around them. But stars in that world are not the great flaming globes they are in ours. They are people. Edmund and Lucy had met one. They actually met a retired star. So now they found showers of glittering people, all with long hair like burning silver and spears like white hot metal, rushing down to them out of the black air, swifter than falling stones. They made a hissing noise as they landed and burnt the grass. And all these stars glided past them and stood somewhere behind, a little to the right. And then we have this moment where basically some people make oaths by Tash, which is the god of the Calumem. And C.S. Lewis basically portrays that as like Satan, because obviously brown people worship Satan, I guess, is the conclusion there. And somebody asks like whether any of the oaths they made by Tash are no longer valid. The lion growled so that the earth shook, but his wrath was not against me, and said, It is false, not because he and I are one, but because we are opposites. I take to me the services which thou hast done to him. For I and he are of such different kinds that no service which is vile can be done to me, and none which is not vile can be done to him. Therefore, if any man swear by Tash and keep his oath for the oath's sake, it is by me that he is truly sworn, though he know it not, and it is I who reward him. And if any man do a cruelty in my name, then, though he says the name Aslan, it is Tash whom he serves, and by Tash his deed is accepted. Dost thou understand me, child? I said, Lord, thou knowest how much I understand. But I said also, for the truth constrained me, yet I have been seeking Tash all my days. Beloved, said the glorious one, unless thy desire had been for me, thou wouldst not have sought so long and so truly, for all find what they truly seek. So yeah, getting a bit sort of religious for my, my likings there. And we have another character uh, who talks about something. Then he says, it's all in Plato. Bless me, what do they teach them at these schools? And this is like a recurring thing. C.S. Lewis was not happy with the state of British schooling. So God knows what I'd make of it now. But yeah, all in all, I didn't particularly enjoy this one. I think a lot of it was because the things he was trying to communicate were just too heavy handed and not very subtle. Just the big battles are getting grating to me now. Didn't really care about any of the characters, including the ones who were coming back as well. Actually, weirdly, I've started to like Edmund by this point. Uh, but yeah, I just, yeah, it was quite dull. And uh, yeah, certainly not my favourite. It wasn't as bad as The Horse and His Boy, but it was my second least favourite of the series. I gave it a 2.5 out of 5, which means overall throughout the series, I gave two 2.5s, two fours, and three 3.5s, which I think isn't too bad. And I'm pretty glad that I finished the series. So yeah, there we have it. That's what I thought of The Last Battle by C.S. Lewis. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book if you read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video. Hit subscribe for more. And I'll see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.